Welcome to Searching the Scriptures, presented by The Church of Christ. Your speaker is Brother James D. MacDonald, Evangelist. We ask you to get your Bibles and study along with us. Go we therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Greetings, friends, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and welcome to another Search in the Scriptures telecast. And my, oh, my, what a joy it is for us to come here every time to work on these lessons, simple and elementary, that we can all comprehend and understand, that we can hear, believe, and obey the precious gospel the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and Him crucified be added to the Lord's New Testament church and live a faithful Christian life and go home to heaven when this life is over. Heaven will surely be worth it all and then some neighbors and friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. We urge you to get your Bible, your pencil and paper and jot down the things that we say today and every time we're here on this program, make sure and certain we're teaching those things found recorded in the pages of inspiration. Remember, the Bible is the book that will judge us all in that last and final day, so it makes sense to follow what the Bible says in this present day as we travel down here below in this life. It's always a joy to study together from God's holy word. I want to invite you to call all your friends and neighbors, inform them of the time slot on this program, and urge them to listen, tune in, Watch and listen attentively to the things that we say from God's Word and that they might learn more about God's will while we have the time and while we have the opportunity. And of course, time and opportunity that we say so many times are swiftly passing and one day is going to be our last day and one day is going to be the day of judgment, the second coming of Christ, and we'll all appear before that great judgment seat of Christ and answer the deeds done in this body, whether it be good or whether it be bad, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. In 2 Corinthians 5, 11, Paul goes on to say, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, that is advanced notice, advanced knowledge, we persuade men. There's only one way to persuade men and women, boys and girls, to become a Christian and live the faithful Christian life. And it's that power of persuasion in the book that we call the Bible. In Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, and as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So as we read and study the Bible, we know that time is swiftly passing. In Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Redeeming the time means to uh, enjoy the present time that you have and take advantage of every opportunity to yield your will to God's will. Taking advantage of every moment hour, day, and year of knowing more about the Bible and God's Word and sharing it with your family, your friends, your neighbors, with everyone you come in contact with. Have the attitude of old Joshua in Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's make it a dominant factor in our lives to warn ourselves, to warn our families, and warn all humanity, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's something we need to focus on more and more each and every day. Today we're studying a subject entitled Membership in the Lord's Church is Essential. On a previous broadcast, we noticed God's plan of salvation and uh, simply pointed out that in order to be saved eternally, we must yield our will to God's will. We emphasize what can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. On the great day of Pentecost, when the first gospel sermon was preached, we find what they had to do to contact that blood and be added to that church that you read about in the Bible. The one that he purchased with his own precious blood. In Acts 2, beginning with verse 36, we find the Bible says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He makes it clear as a Christian what he's talking about. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now that shows if there was not another passage in the Bible, there is something we must do. There is God's part, and there is man's part. God and Christ have done their part. God sent His Son here to Calvary to suffer, to bleed, and to die. And Jesus willingly came to this earth, this land of sin and sorrow, of whom the world was not worthy, and suffered and bled and died and was buried and arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And now we have it recorded in this book that we call the Bible. So God loves us. God sent His Son. His Son yielded His will to the Father's will. He always pleased the Father in every single thing that He done. So He says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were guilty of crucifying the Lord of glory. There was something they needed to do. In fact, the Bible says that's what they must do. Now must is an imperative. Now in doing this, they was not earning their salvation or working out their salvation, but they was yielding to God's will who produces salvation through obeying the promise of His Word. And so there was something they could do and had to do and must do to please God. We hear preachers all the time on TV, radio, in the printed page, in the pulpit saying, there's nothing to do. Jesus done it all when He died on Calvary. Well, that's true. He died on Calvary, but there is something we must do. Through the apostles, He said, men and brethren, what shall we do? But in doing this, we're pleasing God and following God's instructions. It's God telling us what to do, and it's us yielding and doing that which He tells us to do. So there's God's part, there's Christ's part, there's the Apostle's part in, in bringing the Word, and then there's our part in yielding our will to God Almighty's will. And he says then in verse 38, then, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you. Now how many of them? How many needed to repent? Every one of them. How many of them need to be baptized? Every one of them. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. You mean it can't be in no other name? No, it can't. Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other. Not other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, what's the purpose of repenting and being baptized? For the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So repentance and baptism are for remission or forgiveness of our sins. It was the forgiveness of their sins. It's for the forgiveness of our sin. Now, the Bible makes that clear as a Christian. And in addition to having the remission of your sins, when you repent and be baptized, you will also receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost. Romans 8 and 9 says, if we don't have the Spirit of Christ, we're none of His. Acts 5, 32 says He gives the Spirit to them that obey Him. So not only does He give remission of sins when people repent and be baptized, as they did on Pentecost, He also gives them the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the promise is unto you, not only to those that are at that time, now notice, and to your children, you and your children, this was a Jewish audience here on the day of Pentecost, this promise is unto you and to your children 
and to all that are afar off. Now that's the Gentiles he's talking about here because the Jews are those always in the Bible that are nigh. But he says here now, it's a promise unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, that is the Gentiles, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And of course the gospel is God's call to both Jew and Gentile. There's no racial boundaries. Every one in the human race is subject to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It makes no difference if your skin is white, black, red, yellow, or whatever color it might be. God is no respecter of persons. Acts 10, 34 and 35. Of a truth I perceive, and the word under, perceive means to understand or to know, that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation. He that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And then he says, for well, the promise is unto you and to your children, all that are far off, and the Lord of God shall call. Many of the words he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now, they couldn't save themselves of themselves, but they saved themselves by obeying the plan of salvation he was talking about right here. And this is the very first time after the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus from the dead that this plan had ever been preached in its actuality. It was preached in prophecy in the Old Testament. It was preached in promise in the Old Testament, but not in actuality till Pentecost. So if, you, if people deny the plan of salvation here, they're denying the first plan of salvation God ever offered to all humanity in actuality, you see. So that's, that's a dangerous thing to have that frame of mind and attitude to say something is not necessary that God says is mandatory for all human beings. Then they're that glad to receive his word were baptized. Well, I wonder how many more were glad to receive his word. Well, were any more baptized because they didn't gladly receive his word. Every time somebody gladly receives the word of God, they'll be baptized. And if they don't gladly receive the word, they won't be baptized. That's why so many preachers fight scriptural baptism. We know baptism of itself cannot save by itself and of itself, but through hearing, believing, repenting, confessing Christ, then being baptized for the remission of sins, that brings the consummation, you see. That's when we contact the blood of Christ. Baptized into Christ, put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. You're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now, let's notice in... Romans chapter 6 from the book of uh, the Apostle Paul is writing here and notice what he says. The book of Romans chapter 6 beginning with verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glow of the Father even so we also shall walk in newness of life. Now notice verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So in baptism for the remission of sins, the body of sin is destroyed. We put on that new man. We raise to walk in newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Where does that take place? In Christ, you become a new creature. And you're baptized into Christ, and you put on Christ, you see. So that's plain and simple. The death, the burial, and resurrection from the dead. We obey from the heart that form of doctrine, Romans 6, 17 and 18. God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. When is the then? When we obey and complete that form of doctrine. And that's when we come up out of the water grave of baptism. And then the Lord adds us himself to the church that he said, upon this rock I will build, Matthew 16 and 18. I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That was a statement referring to the future when the church would be established. Jesus had to go to Calvary and suffer and bleed and die and be buried and rise again from the dead, the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, before the church could be established. 
you see, you couldn't be forgiven by the blood of Christ until he shed his blood, was buried, and arose from the dead. Hebrews 9, 16, and 17 said, A testament's a force after men are dead, otherwise there's no strength at all while the testator liveth. For where a testament is, there must also necessity be the death of the testator. And so Christ's New Testament began after his death, burial, resurrection from the dead, his exaltation, coronation, and magnification back at God's own right hand. And in Acts 2 and verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. All who subscribe to that plan of salvation here in Acts 2 for the first time became members of the Lord's church, the one he bought with his blood, the only one the Bible knows anything about. It was not a denomination in any sense of the word. Denomination means division. Jesus pleaded for unity. He prayed that we all be one, my Father art in me and I in thee, that the world may believe thou hast sent me. And so when the Lord added them to the church daily, such as should be saved, Acts 2, 47, the Lord died for us. The Lord does the saving. The Lord has the plan of salvation plainly made so we know what to do to be saved. And the Lord saves us and the Lord adds us to his church, the one he said upon this rock, I will Bill, that's one more than nothing and one less than two. And that's all you can make of it. And he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He didn't say Peter's church or Paul's church or John's church or Martin Luther's church or the church of the Pope of Rome. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church, a personal pronoun. Now, if I said to you, and after a church service, if you were gathered there together with us, I want, I want you to meet my wife. Whose wife do you think I'd be talking about? Somebody else's? No. Or out in the parking lot is my automobile. That's a personal pronoun referring to personal possession. When Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, he obviously was thinking of the one that he died for on the cross to purchase and pay for with his blood. He bought it and paid for it with his blood. Acts 20, 28, take it yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers which to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Purchased with his own blood. The purchase price of the church is the blood of Christ. How could any church be equal to that church? Not a denomination, not a building, not a meeting house. The body of Christ. He purchased it and bought it and paid for it with his own blood. Therefore, it should wear and honor his name, right? When we seen that sweet little gal that we married to now, we began to date her and, and pop the question. And then when we went through the marriage ceremony and when the, the ceremony was completed, whether it's just the peace or minister of the gospel or whatever, the preacher would say or the, the informant in charge would say, I now present unto you Mr. and Mrs. James Smith. She wears the name of her husband gladly. Do you think he'd want to live with her? Would you want to live with a woman who wouldn't honor and wear your name? That's a good question. It's easy to answer, isn't it? Well, you see, the church is the bride of Christ. We're married to Christ and we obey the gospel. It's a spiritual marriage that takes place. And so we honor Christ's name. The church is the bride of Christ. It wears his name, you see. And when he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not fail you. How much plainer could he make it? If he wanted to tell you that he had a church, he died for the church, he bought it with his blood, and he wanted it to be honored in his name, what else could he say? He said it's a plain, and yet people go away saying, well, I just can't see that. Well, are you looking for the truth? Are you looking to try to authorize something not according to the truth? That's the question you need to be asking yourself. And so God adds all the saved to the church. So membership in the Lord's church is essential. That's the Lord's church now. I'm not talking about a man-made church. I'm talking about the church of the Bible. I'm talking about the bride he's coming back to get when he comes back again, you see. He says, come up hither and I'll show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. The church is the bride of Christ. He's married to the church. Every one of us, when we obey the gospel and become a Christian, we're added to the Lord's church. We have an individual marriage with Christ. Think of that. We're spiritually married to Christ. We've got an individual marriage to Christ. Then when Christ comes back 
at the end of time, he's coming back for his bride around the globe, you see. And that's collectively he's talking about. He talks about it in an individual manner. He talks about it in a collective manner when he comes back for his entire bride. That is, those who are spiritually married to him around the world. And that's a wonderful thing to think about. So God adds all the saved to the church. In Colossians 1, 13 and 14, let's look at what the Bible says. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us in the kingdom of his dear son. Now notice he connects the kingdom and the church together. And, talk, and he connects redemption in the very next verse. He says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Well, you see, forgiveness of sins comes through the blood of Christ. And when we submit our will to God's will, a spiritual operation takes place and we are cleansed from all of our sins a spiritual circumcision of the heart takes place. You know, back under the Old Testament, the men, the boys rather, who were eight days old had to be circumcised literally, the foreskin cut away. But when we obey the gospel of Christ, we have a spiritual circumcision. The old man, the old heart is cut away and, and the new heart is, repla repla is replaced by that new heart, you see. So it's a spiritual circumcision, a spiritual cleansing, you see. And that's what it's all about. And the church and the kingdom are one and the same institution. When the Lord talks about the church in Matthew 16 and 18, He said, I'll build my church. Then in verse 19, He said, I'll give unto thee the keys, Peter, the, of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So the apostles had the binding and and loosing power. He refers to the church and then he gives him the keys to the kingdom. They're interchangeable terms. When you look at it from the point of the church, it's the body of Christ. When you look at it from the point of the kingdom, it's the government of God, the government of Christ, you see. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. All power hath been given unto him, both in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28 and verse 18. And so that's crystal clear. And it's so simple that we cannot miss it plainly from the Bible, you see. And the second point is Christ is the Savior of the church. God adds all the saved to the church, and Christ is the Savior of the church. Well, Brother McDonald, how do you know that? How can you say that? Well, let's just read the Bible. Ephesians 5, verse 23, from the pen of the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 5 and verse 23, and the Scripture says, now listen to that reading carefully, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. He's the Savior of the body. Well, what is the body? What does the Bible say? And how many bodies are they? Since He's the Savior of the body, we've got to be in the body of which Christ is the Savior in order to be saved, right? How else could we reason it? Well, what is the body of Christ? Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body. There is one Spirit. If you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. How many bodies are they? Just one. There's one body. Just as many bodies as there is lords and gods and faiths, and there's one of each. The Bible's a book of oneness. There is one body. In Colossians 1.18, let's look again. Colossians 1.18 in your Bible. And here's what the Bible says. Colossians 1.18, if a pen of the Apostle Paul wrote the church of Colossae, and he is the head of the body, the church. Now notice, he's the head of the body. That's an, one, that's an absolute. He is the head of the body, who is Christ, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Who's that? That's Christ. He's the first, first one to raise from the dead to die no more. That's what he's talking about. The firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. 
That means exaltation, glorification, magnification, far above all principality and power and dominion and might, both in this world and that which is to come, you see. And so that's in Colossians 1, 24, let's look again. Who now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. The church is the body. The body is the church. There's one body. There's one church, according to your Bible. According to the Bible. Now, if you get more than that, you'll get ready out of some other book than that. But that's what the Bible plainly teaches. And Ephesians... He points it out, and he points it out in uh, other Colossians and different places. In Ephesians 1, let's notice again, 22 and 23. <clears throat> he says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him, that's Christ, to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body, church is the body, the body is the church, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. The fullness of God is in Christ. The fullness of Christ is in the church that He set upon this rock. I will build. And thirdly, membership in the Lord's church is essential because we are reconciled to God in the church. In Ephesians 2, verse 16, let's look again at what the Bible says. Ephesians 2, verse 16, And that he might reconcile both unto God, that is Jew and Gentile, in one body, that's the church, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now think of that. Reconcile in Christ, in the church. So if we're not reconciled in Christ in the church in that one body, then we're alienating ourselves from Christ, you see. So in order to be in Christ, we've got to obey the gospel. We've got to live according to the teachings of the Bible. The Bible will judge us in the last day. Again, I emphasize, why follow anything but the Bible in this present day? That'll take us home to heaven for sure. No guesswork, no question marks. No, I hope so's or possibly so, or maybe so's. Absolute surety when you follow the book that's sure. God's Word. Heaven will be ours. And if we don't follow that Word, we'll be lost. We thank you for listening and watching today. Our time is up. We thank you for yours. Goodbye, friends. Searching the Scriptures has been brought to you by The Church of Christ. For questions, comments, or a free Bible correspondence course, write Brother James D. MacDonald. 88 Hoover Road, Woodbury, Tennessee, 37190, or call toll-free at 877-222-8818. Join us next Sunday for Searching the Scriptures.